Good afternoon everyone, my name is Lewis, welcome back to the channel, I hope you're all safe and well. So today I'm going to be talking about three albums I've been listening to recently. I'm going to talk about each album in turn and what I feel is really good about an album, what I'm slightly disappointed in. Um, I'm going to give you my highlights from each album and yeah, have a listen. I, with each album, I would suggest having a listen for yourself and see if they fit into your particular collection. So first out of the gate today is a 1978 release by a gentleman called Michael Urbaniak and the album is called Ecstasy. There we go. Um, yeah, quite an interesting cover there. Um, slightly dated to modern eyes. Um, I'm sure at the time they thought it was sexy and sassy and seductive. Um, I don't think it fits any of those criteria now. Unfortunately, it's a bit weird, if anything. So um, bless you for trying. But um, yeah, I don't think you really hit the mark there. So um, in terms of the album, um, I found this to be a lovely slice of late 70s uh, fusion from Polish born electric violin supremo Urbaniak. Now, um, I came to Urbaniak quite late in terms of like knowing who he is um, and along with a gentleman called Michael White, they have kind of, um, certainly in my collection, they have the monopoly on electric violin artistry type thing. Um, both are very, very good. Um, I pretty much worked with everyone. Um, they kind of hanged around in similar, if not identical circles. And they are, in terms of my memory, um, interchangeable almost in terms of their styles. So um, if you never heard of either Michael White or Michael Urbaniak, uh, please check out their back catalogue. It's well worth a visit and see if there's anything which uh, tickles your fancy, as us English would say. Um, so yeah, overall, I found this to be a joyful piece, um, with several gems to be found on it. Um, let's just say the musicianship on display here is first rate. Uh, there's the, we're not even going to debate that it's, it's of a high caliber. So fantastic in knowing that, but there are some problems with this album, um, which I'm going to go over briefly with you. Um, my main uh, problem is, is that the compositions themselves don't mesh together to make a narrative or a cohesive narrative anyway. Um, this feels to me like a greatest hits kind of album where it's just material, random material, which is good in and of itself. And it's just all kind of glued together to make an album, but it's not an overarching there is no concept behind this album so um yeah loads of artists do the same thing so i'm not gonna you know criticize too hard i just think it's a bit of a pity because he certainly has some talent mr Abaniak. so it would have been nice to see him do something a bit more creative but hey you gotta pay the bills somehow um the second issue i have with it is that it suffers from almost being instantly forgettable as a listening experience now um, i'm going to highlight three tracks in a moment which i think are truly worthy on this particular album but in the context of the album and the the total experience it's kind of like well once i turned it off it it, it ceased to resonate and that's because as i said the first problem is is that it's a collection of singles rather than a cohesive narrative so that kind of explains it um, but yeah it is a problem yeah and it's a real shame because there's some talented artists on, on display here and it would have been so much nicer to see them really stretch their their abilities in a more conceptual piece so um, the tracks that I want to highlight from this album are free Wants to make you feel good and the fantastic A Day in the Park. Lovely tune. Um, 
So, um, my conclusion about this album would be a Banyak is due for a retrospective at some stage. He, he's definitely due. He's that talented. Um, and there are, you know, so many more new listeners who haven't heard his work or Michael White's. And they are deserving of, you know, another chance to get their music out there. The um, issue is, is that if I was in charge, and I'm not saying I am, um, it would be love to be in that position, um, I would not release his albums uh, singularly. Um, what I would do instead is to... I've got probably about four of his albums. He's got quite a bit of body of work. I would cherry pick from those albums and make an anthology piece. I think that's the way forward. And if they released it on 180 gram, 45 RPM, I'm I'm buying it regardless of price. I'm going to get it because, yeah, he certainly does have the, the material uh, to justify that sort of purchase. So, um, yeah. Notables on this album are uh, Mr. Bernard Purdy on drums. Now, if you've never heard of Bernard Purdy, very good. Um, yeah, he, he's played with quite a few people as well. So check out his stuff as well. Um, well, well worth a listening, a uh, listen to. Um, so yeah, it was nice to hear that he had featured on this album. Yeah, giving it, you know, his own little bit of a contribution. So it was a nice surprise to find him in the credits. So well done. So, yeah, that's the first album. The second album today is a 1972 release, and it's by an artist by the name of Ellen McElwain, and the album is entitled Honky Tonk Angel. There you go. So there is Miss McElwain with her cat. I forgot the cat's name. I read it somewhere. I can't remember for the life of me. Um, so... Um, there is a lot to like and love about this particular album. It's gutsy and spirited, but ultimately underrated in its, well, the perception of her performance from uh, singer, songwriter and guitarist Mikel Wayne. So that jumbled sentence, what I'm really trying to say is, is that she's really good. And it's a real shame more people don't actually know about her. Um, and perhaps by doing this video, one or two of you will take a listen to her back catalogue and you might feel that it's something that you want to own. And well, as you can see, it's in my hand, so I certainly thought it was worth it. Um, I particularly enjoy the measured defiance, uh, which characterises her vocal style and tone. It's, it's, it's gritty. There's, there's, yeah, there's like, there's an impertinence to it, which I quite like. Um, songs were sung with a uh, notable passion and soul and I can't say that about every artist that I listen to um, sometimes that's overridden by charisma but in terms of in this particular case um, this is just vocal talent she's very good very very good um, her acoustic guitar playing is um, also something to behold um, it has a bassy, earthy kind of texture to it, which complements her vocal style. So I'm going to give her double bravo um, for that. Um, but yes, uh, like the Urbaniak before, um, there is a few problems with this particular album. Um, the compositions on this album... Um, as a whole, I'm speaking, not as like for individual tracks, but as a whole, the problems would be um, they don't really suit uh, Mikel Wayne's vocal style. Um, I think one too many experiments were done here, whereas I would have, if I was the producer, I would have reined her in a bit and said, look, you know, you got talent, girl. Um, but this isn't, you know, we're trying to get your name out there. So perhaps, you you know, you can sing a couple of like cover tunes. Just do your own versions of things. There's no shame in doing that. Um, she's tried to go a bit too into stamping her own kind of unique flavour in by way of choosing compositions. So they don't entirely work as an album. But um, there are tracks to be found on here which are very, very good. Um, 
Yeah, um, I was disappointed by there were too few occasions uh, where Mikel Wayne got into her stride. Um, so it made the overall experience a bit bitty, as I would say. Um, the standout tracks on this particular album are Can't Find My Way Home, which is, oh, um, it's just beautiful. Wings of a Horse and Wade in the Water. Um, which she again she does uh, she does some lovely vocals on that particular track so yeah I would really 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 recommend to you guys out there um, to have a listen to those three tracks um, you're in for an absolute treat notables on this album would be Candido on congas and he does appear you can hear him distinctly on Wade in the Water and it yeah he he brings some juice to that. There's no doubts about that. And Thad Holiday on bass, who does a superb job um, throughout the whole album. Um, but yes, on the three highlight tracks, he he really does crank it up to a different level. So yes, uh, Mr. Holiday, um, I enjoyed your playing. So well done to you, sir. So that's the second album. The last album for today is a 1969 release by a gentleman called uh, Jorge Duelo Lima Menezes, otherwise known as Jorge Ben or Jorge Ben, and it's a self-titled album. Yeah, I like that cover. It's, um, yeah, I just like it. It's, it, it just makes me laugh. Um, and I like the Flamingo Brazilian football team logo there. And I think it features up here somewhere. Yeah, I think that's a nice touch. Um, I'm not sure if you was English and put like um, your Man United crest on your album cover or, or something like that. Or, you know, Brighton or Newcastle. I, I'm not sure if it would have gone down well. But certainly in this context, it works for me. Um I like and respect this album. Um, there's no doubts about it. Um, not only for its musicality, but also for the risks that it took. Now, I'm talking with modern hindsight, um, but certainly at the time of when this um, album was released and a few years before that, prior to its release, um, Brazil was going through, in terms of its music, it was going through a, a level of patriotism. Um, now, I think the context we should give it is, I'm not sure what really, in on the international stage, what Brazil's contribution is. I'm not entirely sure, apart from these two things, which is football, or soccer as you call it in North America, and music. So those are the two things that really sets the nation apart from other nations for their high level of performance in those two spheres of entertainment, so to speak. Now, um, with the advent and success of Bossa Nova, um, they seem to have developed a, a kind of mentality that we're doing well with this. Let's just keep the gravy train, you know, going. Don't rock the boat. Don't do anything. Don't change things up because the world likes Bossa Nova. Let's keep keep with it. It's working. Um, <laughs> Mr. Uh, George Ben kind of, he decided he was going to go against that. <laughs> um, so he's quite a rebellious character. Um, and that's why I like him. Um, he kind of said, he was more thinking that, yeah, um, to our ears, in, well, to outsiders ears, this is all new and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, good on you, whoever is making money from it or doing good music from it. Yeah, go for it. Um, but it's not new to me. I kind of want to push the frontiers of this genre. You know, I want to take it to its next logical step. So there was a bit of a backlash uh, for his attitude and he got sent to the naughty step. Um, so he had to sit out a couple of years um, out of the spotlight, which is a real shame. Um, Yes, so one of the things that I like about uh, Georges Ben is his, for me anyway, his unique uh, vocal phrasing and delivery, um, which makes me think of the term, 
it's it's in the yeah it's kind of like joyful mischievous yet not ignoring the world as it is but i kind of if i was to kind of encapsulate what i'm thinking it his vocal style is to me anyway similar to the feeling of gallows humor where he finds amusement uh in i've written it down somewhere where he, yeah, he finds amusement in situations which others would probably interpret as dire. So he just accepts what it is and um, he's, he's not trying to ignore it. In fact, it, it, it's, the, it's the reality of things which kind of makes him behave in the way that he does, um, so to speak. <laughs> I'll probably explain that really badly. Um, so, yeah. So on this album, uh, the lyrics and the compositions, for me anyway, are more social commentaries, uh, more slice of life observations, and perhaps even a bit of philosophy in there as well. Um, do remember, I don't speak a lick of por Portuguese, so um, I'm, yeah, I'm just freestyling my interpretation. I've got no basis of fact in what I'm saying. So him doing that in the context of what was selling well or what the face which Brazil wanted to put out at that time which was more about the Copa Cabana beach the sun the the sexy ladies and um that sort of theme he he was he wasn't really his compositions weren't really about that um, so yeah that's where he was getting a bit of resistance and that's why I kind of respect him um, he, he, he fought the it was easy for him to conform um, there was not a, it's not a case of he couldn't do it because he certainly could and you hear examples of it on this album but yeah that, that wasn't really his thing he, he wanted to push the boundaries so yeah but to modern ears you, you probably go oh it all sounds the same um, but that's kind of like the context of when this album came out so um the tracks that I would recommend from this album would be uh, uh, Criola, Dominguez, and Take It Easy, My Brother, Charles. Um, it's really spelt Charles, but the way he sings it is Charles. Um, it may be in Portuguese, that's how they say it. So, yeah, um, those are the three tracks that I would recommend from this album. So it gave me a lot to think about this particular one. Um, have a listen to it see what you think um please do comment down below um whether you think what i said was you know complete garbage or you have some sympathy for what i'm trying to articulate but yeah um so yeah all three albums today they are good in i mean they have some really strong highlights but probably as a narrative whole each one of them has a, you know an issue but um, that's not particularly a bad thing. Um, a, it stimulates conversation. B, no album is perfect or there's very few. So in those wins which are bordering on perfection, everybody knows about. So yeah, in record collection, record collecting, you're going to get ebbs and flows. Um, I'm not disappointed in any of those purchases, but I do realise that in terms of the pantheon of albums that I have, you know, they're not complete albums in and of themselves. They all got their faults. So um, thank you very much for joining me today and listening to my ink and incoherent waffling about vinyl I've been listening to recently. Um, this one was slightly different in the sense of um, you, some of my frustrations with each of those albums did spill out a bit compared to other videos but I wanted you guys to hear and see that for yourselves as well not everything I have I would say oh that's you know a 10 out of 10 far from it so um, until the next episode uh, please look after yourselves stay safe and I will see you soon with a next, next batch of tunes to go over and review so until then Take care. Bye-bye.